welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Father God, we come before you in this place tonight, and we are just grateful for the opportunity that we have to come into the house of the Lord. Father, your word says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Why? Because that is where your presence is, Lord. Your word says that when two or more are gathered together, you are there in the midst of us, Father. And we thank you that you are here today. God, we don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. God, we don't come to church for entertainment. Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So, Lord, it's in the name of Jesus that we ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us tonight, to minister to us. Lord, I ask that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear your word, that it would be a seed planted into good ground in our hearts, that we would leave this place and apply it and live the word of God each and every day in everything that we do, Father, that we would bring glory to you. Lord, we don't see ourselves as better than anybody else, but as co-laborers in the body of Christ. So, Father, the same blessings that we ask upon ourselves, Lord, we ask that you would uh, bestow them upon all the churches all across the Inland Empire and all around the world that are preaching and teaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. We lift up our fellow members of our fellow brothers and sisters at Harvest Christian Fellowship, Father, at Sandals, at the Grove. Lord, I lift up uh, Inland Christian Center, Father, uh, San Bernardino Temple. Father, I lift up Emmanuel Baptist, the Way World Outreach Center, Lord, Abundant Living Family Church. Father, uh, uh, Oak Valley, Lord, Crossroads Christian Center, Lord, all the churches all across the Inland Empire. Lord, we thank you for our uh, uh, Catholic brothers and sisters, our Adventist brothers and sisters, our Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, and Episcopalian brothers and sisters, our Pentecostal and Charismatic brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you that we are such a unique but yet diversified body of Christ, all working together to glorify your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said amen. Well, praise God. I'll tell you what, I'm excited for what uh, God's got in store for you tonight. Now, I asked Elijah, as, as you were being seated, I asked him, you know, I said, did you look at my notes? Because Elijah, his praise and worship song are set, you preached my message, man. No, I'm just kidding. It's good. It's, it's great to work together. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, why don't you turn with me to the book of Matthew in the fifth chapter. Matthew in the fifth chapter. We're going to look at something that Jesus is teaching here in Matthew, the fifth chapter. One of the, one of the great uh, chapters in the, in the Bible, one of the great chapters of the book of Matthew. This is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Uh, if, if you've ever hung around me, if you've ever heard me say uh, anything for any amount of time, one of the verses that we're going to talk about today is definitely one of the ones that I say a lot. It's... It's something that's always resonated within me, um, and it's one of my favorite verses. I know every time I preach, I say that it's one of my favorite verses. I think I just, the Bible is my favorite verse, right? But I'll tell you what, I'm excited for what God's got. I know that, that this, this is going to speak to you tonight. I know that there's some revelation. I know there's some truth that we're going to learn about today. And as well as a, a sense to challenge ourselves to, to do what God has called us to do. And the title of tonight's message is called Lights in the Dark. Lights in the dark. So if you're taking notes, you can write that down. Lights in the dark. Now, before I, I told you, I had to turn to Matthew in the fifth chapter. But before I take you to Matthew in the fifth chapter, I'm going to read to you John in the eighth chapter. And you're like, Pastor Luke, you just said Matthew. I know I'm, we're going to get there, but I want to read to you something interesting. In John the eighth chapter, the twelfth verse, I'll just go ahead and put it up on the overhead. Jesus Christ says this. Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness but have the light of life. So here we see Jesus making an incredible statement, uh, a statement that we hear echoed over and over again, and we're going to see some of these verses tonight as we talk about lights in the dark. Uh, but here Jesus is saying that he is the light of the world. Now I had you turn to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Now in Matthew, the fifth chapter, in the 14th verse, Matthew, the fifth chapter, 14th verse, I love verse number 13, but we're not going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about verse number 14. Jesus is teaching his Sermon on the Mount, his famous Sermon on the Mount, and he says something interesting to you and I. He says, you are the light of the world. Now, interesting, in John the 8th chapter, Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and he who walks in me will not live in dark, but live in the light. Now he goes on and says, now, because I am the light of the world, that reflects to you, and now you and I are the light in the world. You see, Jesus came, he left a legacy, he lived an example, he did many things. The Bible tells us that Jesus told us, his followers and those who were following him, that we will do more and greater things than he because he goes to his father. And now Jesus leaves the legacy of him being the light of the world now to you and I being the light of the world. Now I love the picture that he paints. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. 
Nor do they, verse number 15, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Verse number 16, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So here Jesus is telling us, listen, you and I are the light of the world. And he goes on in, in verse number 16 and he explains that through our good works, through the outward uh, actions or through the outward appearance of on the, what's on the inside of us, because we know that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We know that um, where the heart is or where our treasure is, there our heart lies also. So it's from about the inside. But from the inside out, through our good works, you and I shine a light in darkness. Now we're going to read about some things in, uh, uh, on Wednesday. Was anybody here on Wednesday night? I talked a, a, a ton of message on Wednesday night. Okay, so there's some of you are going to hear some familiarity. Because part of this message was inspired by what we read on Wednesday night. So we're going to go back to Ephesians in the fifth chapter uh, in, uh, for a couple of minutes. Um, and we're going to see some things there. But we're not going to do that right now, so you don't have to turn there. We'll get there. But Jesus is telling you and I that we are the lights of the world through our good works that men might see what that, that men might see the glory of God. Now I want to show an example to you because the Spirit of God is inside of us. You and I become lights in a dark world, shining the glory of God. So I'm going to get something. Paul, will you go ahead and turn the lights off on the hallways? Babe, will you hand me my illustration? Uh, John and Monica, you guys can go ahead and black out the screens. Now let me get in my position. I'm going to make it dark in here for just a moment, and I'm going to show you something. So if you're walking around, hold on, because it's going to get dark. Uh, I promise the lights will come back on, okay? All right, so uh, Missy, will you go ahead and bring the lights down? Pretty amazing how dark it gets in here, isn't it? All you guys with your phones, look at you, it's like a rock concert. Hey, <laughs> all right, put your phones down. You're killing my example. All right. So here you see, we sit in darkness. The Bible tells us that you and I were once in darkness. But here's the thing I want to show you. Here's the, the idea that I want to paint in, you, in your mind. And let me get this uh, prepared. Is It is dark in here. But the Bible tells us that you and I are the light of the world. Now look at this. You see it? Can everybody see the light? Even though it's dark in here, you can see the light. Now, this is just a simple, small LED flashlight. But I want to tell you some things. I want to show you some ideas, and we're going to talk about some of the concepts of light. You see, where light exists, darkness cannot. You know, you always see things in movies. You always see things in Hollywood about the darkness coming and taking over. But the truth is, is that light is the cancer to darkness. That wherever there is light, darkness cannot exist because light over or supersedes darkness. Secondly, no matter where I move this, if I move it over here, it kind of moves away. Because light, you'll, we'll talk about this today, light is directional. And light comes from the source in which it is emitted. All right, now we could go ahead and bring the lights up. You've got, you see the point that I've made. I could put my mag light back together and screw that all back together. All right, thank you for bearing with me. I hope, uh, okay, no, that's all right. It's just, hey, I made it dark. You don't got to clap for making it dark in the, I mean, that's pretty easy. I wish it was that easy to get a clap, but hey, listen, it's not. All right. So we saw some things. We saw that where light exists, darkness cannot. It's not about darkness overcoming light. It rather, the fact is, is that if you shine light in dark, guess what it becomes? Light, right? Because light is stronger than darkness. And Jesus tells us that you and I are the light of the world. Now, I want to take what we just saw, the example of shining a light in a dark room or in a dark situation, in a dark place, and I want to take a look at some of the characteristics of light and what light is like. I mean, now, light goes well beyond these, these three. We're going to take three simple characteristics of light and apply them to our own lives when Jesus says we're the light of the world. Now, obviously, light has many more characteristics than this. Light, there are several forms of light. You know, there's infrared light where you can't see it, and then there's, you know, the, the the, the white light that's actually made up of all the colors of the prism. And, and there's many characteristics, but I want to show you what you and I saw today, some of the characteristics of light, and how we can apply that to our lives. Okay? Okay? Okay. All right. Good. All right. I know you were just kind of trying to figure out, should I answer them or not? Okay. Yes, you can. So we're going to take some look at some characteristics of light. Number one today, and we're going to take a look at these, what Matthew, and compare them to what Jesus says in Matthew, the fifth chapter. Number one today, light is conspicuous. Now, I know some of you are like scratching your head, you're like, conspicuous, what does that mean? Have you ever heard the word inconspicuous? 
Somebody's trying to be inconspicuous. They're trying to blend in. They're trying to, you know, not stand out. Inconspicuous is something that we might hear or the word. You don't really hear the word conspicuous very often. But light is conspicuous. What that means is that light stands out. Light is highly visible, especially in the dark. You guys understand that concept? Light stands out. And Jesus tells us in Matthew, the fifth chapter, the verse number 14, he says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. So light is visible from many miles away. A city on a hill, Jesus paints the idea. Now, we, we're so blessed to live at the base of a beautiful mountain range. We've got the San Bernardino National Forest and, and the Los Angeles National Forest and as well as, the, uh, as Mount Idlewild over there. And, uh, and, and, and so we've got mountains all over the place. And you've seen it before in the clear night sky when the rim of the world, the home's right there on the rim of the world. I, I was actually blessed enough to grow up on a, on a street. I think it was called Ocean View Drive, right, in, in Blue Jay, California. So we actually live right there on the rim of the world. And you've seen it on a clear night when people in their homes have their lights on. You can see them from miles and miles and miles away. A city on a hill is not easily hidden. Why? Because you and I stand out. As lights in the world, we stand out. Now, when it was dark, it was dark. And some of you had your phones on, and you, your eye immediately kind of saw the phone. When I turned my little LED flashlight on, instantly... It stood out in the darkness, right? I mean, it was unmistakable that there was a bright light in the midst of a dark place. So Jesus tells us, you and I are the lights of the world. We're a city on a hill. We cannot be hidden. You and I are conspicuous. We stand out. You guys with me on this? We as lights are lit by Jesus. We are conspicuous. We are valuable, visible. We are noticeable. You know, we use lights to stand out, to be conspicuous on many things. As you're driving home tonight, I don't know if you, you've ever really noticed it, but the car in front of you has what attached to the back of it? Well, it has a license plate, Lori, but it also has something a little bit more conspicuous than that. What does a light have on the back of it? Lights, right? The red tail lights and the red brake light. So that you know in the dark that there is what in front of you? A car. Okay. Now as you're driving to a downtown or metro, metro, metropolitan area. Wow, I, I, I could get it out. A metropolitan area. You'll see on the tops of the buildings or on tops of high radio towers. What do you see on tops of those? So that airplanes can see them, right? Well, let's look at airplanes. In the night sky, you look up and you say, wow, those are really bright stars, especially here in California because we see so many bright stars in Southern California, right? And you look up in the sky and you look at all those bright, glimmering, glistening stars and you wonder, I didn't think the stars moved that fast. It's because we put lights on airplanes so that we can see them from miles away. So we put lights on things we want to stand out. And Jesus is saying, you and I are a light on a hill. A city that is set on a hill cannot be easily hitting. What this means to you and I, what does this mean? How does this apply to being the light of the world? Let me challenge you. Let me, let me, what's the word? Let me sock it to you. Does that make sense? If you've got Jesus, you ready for this? If you've got the Lord in you, the, the Spirit of God inside of you, and you are what Jesus says you are, the light of the world, you should stand out. Pretty quiet. You see, as Christians, oftentimes what we want to do, especially in our 21st century church and where we're at with America and, and not wanting to offend anybody, is we really just want to blend in. Let me do my thing, you do your thing, and, and we'll all be all right there. You know, you, it's okay, you, you know, over here, I don't, want to, I don't want to say anything offensive, so, you know, I'm not going to use the word Jesus during Christmas. Or, you know, and we begin to blend in, but here Jesus says, listen, light is conspicuous like a city on a hill. You can see it coming from miles and miles and miles away. You can see it like a lighthouse on a, on a dense, foggy morning. We, you and I are designed to cut through the darkness and shine brightly for the world to see. So you and I are to be conspicuous. That means that you and I are to stand out. We have got to stand out bright and not blend in. We want to blend in. That's what our flesh wants us to do. That's what the enemy wants us to do. You know, one of the things, this isn't even in my notes, but one of the things that I was telling somebody this, this week, two different people I was telling somebody this week, you know, one of the devices that the enemy loves to do is to get us to believe the lie. 
One of the devices, you see, the devils always work the same way, thoughts, ideas, and intentions. You know, when Eve and Adam were in the, in, in the garden, the devil didn't show up with an army of demons and an army of his angels and be like, hey, eat the apple, you're dead. He deceived Eve, right? When, when Jesus was in the wilderness, the devil didn't show up with his legions of demons and, and Jesus show up with his legions of angels and it was like this big, epic movie scene battle with angels and demons. No, the devil was talking to Jesus. Turn the bread into, and turn the rock into bread. You can do it. Y'all throw yourself off the cliff. You, you know God will rescue. He was trying to get Jesus to believe the lie. And if he can get you and I to believe the lie that when we blend in, that when we focus solely upon our own world and our own self, that all of a sudden what he's done is he's taken the light that Jesus has intended for us to be, a city that is not easily hidden, and he has put a douse or he has uh, covered that light up, so now all of a sudden nobody can tell us from somebody who doesn't know Jesus Christ. Yet you and I ought to be conspicuous. You and I have got to blend in. Are you with me tonight? We were there in Ephesians. It's not going to be up on the overhead because I didn't tell the, tell, tell the video department. But Ephesians, the fifth chapter, this is why Ephesians, the fifth chapter, the verse 15, tells us that you and I have got to walk circumspectly. Because right before verse number uh, 3 through verse number 14, he's talking about living in darkness. And he talks about you and I are called to be in the light. And therefore, in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, 15th verse, Paul the Apostle tells us to walk circumspectly as wise and not as fools. Why? Because you and I stand out. When we are highly visible, that means that we are highly visible. Does that make sense? When you and I stand out, that means everybody can see. And that is why Paul sends the warning to you and I that we ought to walk carefully, that we ought to be cautious about how we live our lives because everybody can see us because we stand out. And if we make poor decisions, if we make bad choices, if we decide to turn our light off, it's very noticeable when a light on a hill that is shining very bright all of a sudden goes dark. Somebody starts to think, oh, something happened there. Uh-oh, they had a moral failure. Oh, man, they must have given up. They must have lost faith. They must have lost hope. So that's why Paul warns us in Ephesians that we have got to walk carefully because you and I are conspicuous. We stand out. Are you with me still? All right, second thought, uh, second characteristics of light. Number two tonight, light is illuminative. Illuminative. This is like a duh Statement. As a matter of fact, I thought it was kind of funny. Mom and I were uh, in the sound booth a couple of weeks ago, and she was using this term. And I, I get now, after having talked to her, what she was talking about. But she was talking about the lights in the background. And she was saying, the lights are not dark enough. And that's what she kept saying over and over. The lights are just not dark enough. And what she meant to say is that there wasn't enough color saturation. But I kept thinking, I kept looking at her like, I don't get it. I, I, I don't get it. A light is not dark enough. When you take a light, let's see, let's see if I can do this. Yep, see? Light, sorry for shining the light in all your eyes. I was trying to shine it in the camera. A light cannot be dark because it's light. You get it? So when she was saying a light, that lights aren't dark enough, I'm like, I'm like scratching my head like, it doesn't make sense. Because a light is illuminative. A light is light. Light is not darkness. Light is light. So what it is is that light is illuminative. What light shines on it illuminates. It brings into the light. You guys with me? So you and I, as the light of the world, you're, you're staring at me like at a cow at a new gate. I don't know. Am I, am I speaking in Chinese tonight? All right. It illuminates. What light, what was once dark it, with light is now exposed. Listen, I'm sure you can all visualize the, the, the uh, illustration or the idea of going into your kitchen or your closet pantry. I pray that it's never really happened to you, but uh, you can probably visualize going into your closet or your, or your kitchen pantry and turning on the light, and all of a sudden, you see the floor start to scurry. Well, yeah, and you, some of you are like, oh, man, yeah, I remember that was last week, Pastor Luke. How about this? Maybe you, some of you are those, are those type that make that midnight sandwich or that midnight snack and you don't want to turn all the lights in the house because you're tired and the lights are bright. So you go to the fridge and you use the light of the fridge and you make yourself like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or you throw a piece of bologna on two pieces of bread and then you come back in the morning and you see on the countertop the bread that you made your sandwich with was covered in mold. <laughs> some of you are like, Pastor Luke, no. Okay, ladies, ladies. If you would have turned on the light in the middle of the night, you would have saw that your husband or your brother or your uncle or somebody left the seat up. 
and you wouldn't have fallen in. Because the light brings things to light. It illuminates. It shows what it really is. And you and I, as the lights of the world, we are to illuminate, to bring the truth to light, to show the truth of God in our lives. Are you with me? In Matthew, the fifth chapter, where they're talking uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the 15th verse, the next verse, Jesus says, Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. When you turn on a light, you expect it to do something, don't you? You expect it to illuminate. You expect it to show what was once in darkness. You don't have to, listen, you don't have to go through the dark rooms of life anymore and stub the proverbial toe on the corner of the dark furniture. Why? Because you and I live in the light. Do you remember John the 8th chapter? Guys, just put it up. John the 8th chapter, the very first verse in the, in the, in that we went on today. John the 8th chapter. Go ahead and put it up. To, yeah. Look what Jesus says. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the what? Light of life. You see, so now you and I, our calling, our purpose in life is to illuminate, to bring to light the things that God has got us to do. We're not just here to sit around. We're not just here to go through life. We have a purpose, and that is to illuminate. Not only then are we highly visible and challenged not to douse our light, but we are also illuminative. We bring to light what men need to see. You know, the darkness carries many secrets. The darkness carries hidden things and light shows them to us. I remember a time when my brother-in-law and I, we went and hiked San Gregorio, to the very top of San Gregorio, and we went through Forest Falls, and we thought, all right, two young guys, it's going to be a couple-hour hike on the way up, a couple-hour hike on the way down. I told my beautiful wife, Stacy, I said, all right, girl, I'll be home at noon. We'll eat lunch together because I'll be hungry. Yeah, around 10 o'clock at night, we were halfway down the mountain because my brother-in-law found a shortcut and we weren't prepared. We didn't have this. We, we, we were starting to get ready. We're like, all right, look, man, it is so dark. We're tripping over rocks. We're, we're running into things. And, and we were finally just about ready to say, okay, we're just going to lay down on the trail. We'll get up tomorrow morning, first thing in the morning, and we'll come home. But we knew that our wives knew that we shouldn't be gone this long. So we knew that our wives were home freaking out. So we were like, okay, we got to work it out. So we had our cell phones lighting the trail in front of us. And that we were walking like this nine miles down from the top of San Gregorio all the way to the base. And the interesting thing is, is we're talking about the darkness hides secrets. The darkness brings things uh, uh, or, or presents itself things. There were times when we'd be walking and you would hear something. Uh, oh my gosh, there's a bear, there's a bear. Or you would hear a, a, a howl or you would think something's running behind you. It's like you would hear footsteps or something coming behind you. There wasn't anything there, but because it was dark, your mind starts to imagine things. Your mind starts to bring things to it. But when we would shine the light behind us, we would see that there wasn't anything there. We would see that there wasn't anything following us. Sometimes in life, we go through life thinking that we're going through life in darkness. And we're starting to think, oh, I'm seeing things, man. Oh, man, life is bad. Oh, God's just out to get me. Oh, you just don't know the, the trouble I've seen. And we start to think that darkness is worse than it really is. And we start to hear things in the dark. We start to hear voices or we start to hear the growls of our life, uh, things coming against us. But when you shine the light on it, when you shine the light of Jesus Christ on your life, all of a sudden what was once in darkness has no place to go but scurry back to the hole that it came from. Because you and I are the light of the world. And we don't have to live a life of darkness. You don't have to go through life wondering about the will of God in your life. You've got the light of the world. You've got Jesus Christ. You don't have to go through life wondering, is this what God has for you? God, is this all that you've got for me? No. You've got more in store for you because you are the light. All you've got to do is turn the light on. You with me? Okay, so we were here in Ephesians, the fifth chapter on Wednesday night. I'm going to put it back up on the overhead in the New Living Translation. Paul the Apostle speaking to the church. And he says in verse number 8, For you were once full of darkness, living in the dark, but now you have the light from the Lord. So live as people of the light. For this light within you produces only what is good, right, and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. 
Interesting. Paul tells the church, listen, you were once in darkness, but no longer do you live in darkness. That's why I say when you go through life, you don't have to stub your toes on the issues of life anymore because you've got the light shining on you. And now you and I have got to live according to the light. The truth, we illuminate. We bring what is good. We bring what is right. We bring what is just to the table. Are you with me tonight? So Paul says, Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful to even talk about the things that the ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. Now, does that mean that you got to go to the world and say, Hey, hey, you sinner, you're going to hell. Get on your ladder at Target when everybody's waiting in line on Black Friday with a bullhorn. Don't shave for a couple of months so that you can resemble John the Baptist in all his glory. No. But what it does mean is that as Christians, as brothers and sisters of Christ, let's start, let's start with the, the, the very source of the light, you and I. That means at home, you can expose what's wrong. If you've got issues, if you've got something going on, stop living with your problems and shine the light on them, the light of Jesus Christ, and get past them and live what is according to the light. In your families, if there's something going on with your kids, start shining the light and speaking the light over it and expose it. You know what? Oh, man, I get on my own little rabbit trail. I remember, I've said this story so many times, it's ridiculous. But I remember when we were in Peru, we were praying for people on a mission trip, and we were just praying, Lord, I pray for healing in the name of Jesus. And a missionary that was living in Peru that was there with us said, listen, you guys are not effective in your prayers, and let me tell you why. And we're like, okay, we're just praying for healing, you know. And he says, because you got to start calling it out. you got to start speaking. If you're praying for somebody's tumor, you start speaking to that tumor. Tumor in the name of Jesus. If it's, if it's cataracts or if it was blindness, you spirit of infirmity, you spirit of a, a cataract in the name. And you would start speaking to it and proclaiming the light of Jesus Christ. What you're doing is you're taking that sickness, you're taking that issue, and you're saying, you know what? Go! Because i got the light. Go scurry back to the dark that you came from. Because you and I are the light of the world. You and I have been given the light of the world, Jesus Christ, and you and I have got to bring to light the things that want to live in the darkness. Yeah. For the light makes everything visible. That's why it says, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So you see that we're, we are to live as people in the light. We don't have to stub our toes in the dark. We have the light that illuminates our lives. We can see more clearly. We can live more maturely. We can understand life with more wisdom because now you and I have light shed upon our lives. Are you with me tonight? Yeah. One more for tonight. Man, it's a short one. This is unlike Pastor Luke. This is a short message. Praise God. One more for tonight. Can we do one more? Are you with me still? All right, one more, one more talking about the characteristics of light. Light is directional. Remember when we were in the dark and I shined the light towards you? You saw it. When I took the light away from you, you didn't see it. Because light, the principle of light is light emits from its source. You get that? Where the sun is, that's where the light comes from. And it comes from the sun in the direction that it goes. Now the sun is a, is a sphere, so light goes in all directions. But the light that is sent out goes in the direction that it is sent. Light travels in a straight line. Now with fiber optics and all that stuff, I know you can bend light and you can reflect light and you can refract light. But light is directional. It shows the source. Now light, you can see it even on a diffused day or when it's overcast, you can see that light comes from somewhere. Even if you can't see the direction of light, you understand that light comes. Like you turn on a light bulb, it's brightest at the light bulb, right? The further away you go, it gets a little bit more and more dark. It was bright right here where I was standing with that light. In the back of the room, it was not as bright because light is directional and it is brightest at the center. Now, the interesting thing is, is that even if you don't see the source of the light, let's take midday. You're walking around midday. The sun is at the highest point in the sky. The sun casts what? Shadows. Because the light is directional. So the light comes and it travels in a line and it hits something that blocks the light and you can see a shadow. So even if you're walking and you're in a place where you can't see the sun, you can look at the shadow and tell, okay, the shadow's going from left to right. That means that the sun is over here. Or the shadow's going from right to left, so that means that the sun is over here. Because you can see the direction that the light is traveling. Are you with me? 
Now let me take you now. What does this mean to your and my life? That light is directional. Matthew, the fifth chapter, 16th verse. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You and I are directional beams of light. And what we are doing is we are directing people through our lives, through our good works, through our actions that coincide with what God has inside of us, with, that coincide with the Spirit of God. We are directing people to the light, Jesus Christ. When they see us, they see the direction that the light is coming from. You see what I'm saying? You and I emit light. Now, we're not literally emitting light. Like, I'm not literally shining light on you. But you and I are shining the glory of God so that when somebody sees us, they can see, wow, the glory of God was there. The glory of God was there. The glory of God was there. Holy cow, what's going on? The glory of God is over here. And they can start to see, wow, Luke was there. Luke was there. Luke was there. Luke was there, and all of a sudden they begin to see that you are directional and that they see the glory of God in your life because you are shining it towards them. But secondly, like we talked about, because light is directional, you can trace back the source. So you are not only directing or shining the glory of God for them to see through your good works, but now because you are shining the glory of God, when I turn the light on, could you, were you in question as to where it was coming from? Was anybody saying, wow. Where's, that little, where's that, little, that little blue LED coming from? You could see the source. So you are attracted to look at the source. So not only are we shining the glory of God or directing the light or the glory of God through our actions outward to the people, but we are drawing their attention inward to the source of the light. So when they look at us, they don't see you and me. They don't see, you know, uh, just a casual or regular run-of-the-mill person who blends in. But rather, when they look at you and I, they see the source of the light. Jesus Christ, and John told us, is the light of the world. So you see, light is directional. It goes both ways. We shine a light, but because we shine a light, they see the source. So we shine the glory of God. Because we shine the glory of God, they look back at us and don't see us. They see God. Psalms 119 chapter says, your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I don't know about you, but that sounds directional. That sounds like, hey, the word of God directs me where I should go. The word of God illuminates the path that I should take. The word of God shows me where to go. So therefore, we talk about the word of God, Jesus Christ being the light of the world, us being a reflection or a source of that light through Jesus Christ. We are directing the world through the word of God. Are you with me tonight? Praise God. 2 Corinthians in the fourth chapter, and we'll conclude with this. Go with, you, go with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians in the fourth chapter. Paul the Apostle speaking to the church in Corinth. Fourth chapter, verse number one, and he says this. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy... We do not lose heart, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame. Remember, in the darkness, things hide. We have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Verse number three, but even if our gospel is veiled it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who, listen to this, do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So here Paul begins to introduce this concept of light shining. And he says, we have this ministry. We don't preach to ourselves. We're not doing this in vain, but rather we're doing this so that we can spread the word of God. And he says that there are people who will not see the light because their light has been veiled or their light has been blinded by the God of this world. The God of this world is Satan. The enemy has put sunglasses on some people so that they won't see. Why? To rob them. Remember, thoughts, ideas, and intentions is one of the things I was telling you, the way the devil works. He's given them thoughts. He's given them ideas. He's given them intentions or, or, uh, in, uh, in, 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 to, to deceive them, to get them to believe the lie that the light that you and I shine is not the truth. 
And so because they see that, because they see the world or they see the light through sunglasses, they have been robbed of their light. And he goes on to say, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Which means that you and I are called to shine on them, but the devil is working on taking their light away. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your, uh, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commended light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So here God has given us the light to show us the knowledge, to show us the glory of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the light is directional. It guides us in our paths. And as we are guided by the light of the world, Jesus Christ, we become a light to ourselves. And we begin to guide those around us. And as we guide those around us, they see the source of the light, not us, but Jesus Christ. And God who commanded, listen, 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 God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. Remember, the devil wants to keep them in darkness. But remember what I told you in the beginning. The characteristics of light is that light supersedes darkness. So the devil may veil their eyes. But let me tell you something. The light of God supersedes the veil that the devil has put over their eyes. And you and I have got to be lights in this dark and dying world. So that we can bring as many people to know Jesus Christ. So that we can bring as many people to the light of the world. Jesus Christ. So that we can bring as many people with us to heaven as we can. So that we don't take what the devil the devil has to rob our friends, to rob our family members, to rob our kids. We don't take that from the devil, but rather we shine the light of Jesus Christ on the dark spot and we let that little cockroach of a devil crawl back to the hole where he came from and we shine the light of God, the glory of Jesus Christ in our lives. So it is imperative, church, tonight that we be what God has called us to be. It is imperative, it is of the utmost importance that you and I shine our lights for the world to see. It is of the utmost importance, number one today, that you and I be conspicuous, to stand out. When somebody sees us, the Bible tell, uh, recounts on several occasions the apostles and the people filled with the Holy Spirit, would their, would, their faces would shine like angels. When Moses came from the presence of God, his face shone. You and I, as we live in the Spirit of God, as we dwell and as we reflect the light of Jesus Christ, let us stand out. Heaven forbid we blend in, but rather let the people around us say, hey, there's something different about you. What is it? Secondly, today, it is imperative, it is imperative to you and I that we illuminate those things around us. Not only do we stand out, but we shine the light on the world, on the dark world, and we show, we bring to light the truth of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And finally today, it is imperative that you and I, as light of the world, give direction. Bring direction. Show that God is a directional God that will guide you, that will lead you in the path that you need to go. All you need to do is turn the light on, the word of God. And you, God will illuminate your path. He will light your path. But not only will he do that, but people will look at you and see the source of the light. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Hey, listen, if you guys got something out of, you've been quiet all night, so I'm going to make you get out, get, get loud. If you got something out of the word, give the, give the Lord a great big praise. Amen. So I want to ask you to do one more thing. Just remain seated for just a few more moments. Let me ask you a question. I want to ask you a simple question tonight. You know, it'd be a tragedy for us to, to get together, to, to hear the word of the Lord and to, to, to worship God, and then to leave this place without giving you the opportunity to examine your life and where you would be for eternity if you were to leave this place tonight and you were to die. So the question I have for you is, if you were to walk out of this place tonight and you were to die, would you open your eyes in heaven or would you open your eyes in hell? It's a relatively simple uh, question, but you know, nobody's going to know that answer except you and God. Now let me ask you another question to the answer. I'm sure you've already come with that. Let me ask you the question here, and the question is this. What makes you think, if you said I'm going to go to heaven, sure I am, what makes you think you're going to get into heaven? Let's examine maybe some of your answers in this place today. 
you know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I hope I get to heaven. I sure think I'm going to get to heaven. If I left this place and I did die, I really want to go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the word of God will you find that you're going to get to heaven, that you can think your way or you can hope your way or because you want it bad enough that God's going to look on you and say, well, they wanted it bad enough, I'm going to let them into heaven. Nowhere in the word of God will you find that you can think, hope, or wish your way into heaven. You just can't. Well, you know, you might say, well, but Pastor Luke, you know, I I wasn't raised as a Buddhist or as a Hindu or as a Muslim or any other type of world religion. So I guess by classification or by default, that means that I'm going to go to heaven. Did you know nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, or as a Muslim, or any other type of world religion, that that means that by default you're going to find your way into heaven? You know, it's just not that way. You know, you might even go as far to say, you know what, Pastor Luke, I don't think that hell exists. I'm not sure that heaven exists. I don't even know where I stand. Maybe there's a God out there in the universe somewhere, or a supreme being, but I'm not sure he's involved in my life. Hey, listen, just because you believe that hell doesn't exist, because you may not be sure if heaven exists or if God is real, doesn't mean that he's not. You know, that's like saying maybe because you grew up in a place where you had never seen a freeway or a semi-truck, that's like saying semi-trucks don't exist, yet you go stand on the slow lane of the freeway and behold, you'll meet one face to face. Listen, I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough today to quit playing games, not to not mess around with you, but to tell you the truth, heaven is a very real place, real enough to mention, real enough for God to mention it, real enough for Jesus to mention it, therefore it's real enough for you and I to take it serious. Heaven is a very real place, and just because you may not think that it doesn't exist, doesn't mean it's not real, it's very real. You know, you might say, well, but Pastor Luke, I'm going to get to heaven because my parents told me as a, Christ, or as a child that I will. They told me as a child that I was a Christian. You know, I was baptized or christened as a baby. Uh, you know, I, I went to Sunday school, Sabbath school, or catechism classes. My parents took me to church on Christmas and on Easter. Here I am in church tonight. That means that I'm on my way to heaven. Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that because your parents told you that you were going to go to heaven, that that means you're going to get there? Can you show me where it says in the Bible that because you went to church on Christmas and on Easter that you're going to get there? Can you show me where the Word of God tells us that because you were baptized, because you were christened, because you went to Sabbath school, Sunday school, or catechism classes that you're going to get into heaven? Hey, you're not going to find it in the Word of God because it's not there. There's more to heaven. There's more to getting into heaven than just uh, what you do and what your parents tell you. You can't get to heaven because you call yourself a Christian, because you wear religious jewelry, because you got a Jesus tattoo on your shoulder or on your back, because you've got John 3.16 or another scripture tattooed somewhere on you. You can't get to heaven that way. There's not, it's not that way. The truth is, is that it's God's heaven. The only way you can get there is God's way. And Jesus Christ said this about himself. He said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man goes to the Father except through him. So no matter what you and I do, no matter what we try to do on the outside, we can never get to heaven except through Jesus Christ. You know, you can't get to heaven because you're a good person. So many people believe, well, if I do good things because I've never robbed a 7-Eleven, because I don't cheat on my taxes, because I don't drive too fast on the freeway, then I'm going to get into heaven. Listen, nowhere in the Word of God does it, will you find that because you're a good person, you're going to you're gonna get to heaven. Hey, listen, there are a lot of good people in hell. Why? Because the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God, are like filthy rags. You see, nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough. You know, a man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the John, the third chapter, and Jesus approach, or Nicodemus approach, approaches Jesus, and they begin to speak on the subject of eternal life, of the kingdom of God. The Bible tells us that Nicodemus was a leader, a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews. What that says to us is that Nicodemus dedicated at least the first 20 years of his life. Nicodemus in our day and age would be like a PhD. He dedicated the first 20 years or more of his life to studying the word of God. Nicodemus talks to Jesus Christ and in the subject of getting to heaven, of subject of eternal life, Jesus says to Nicodemus, you would think that Jesus would say, Nicodemus, you keep doing what you're doing. You keep going the way you're going, you know, because Nicodemus taught in the church. He taught in the temple of his day. Nicodemus had more scripture memorized than you and I uh, could even think would be imaginable. Nicodemus gave to the poor. He did all the right things. And you would think that Jesus says to Nicodemus, man, pat on the back. You just keep on going. Your reward is great in heaven. But Jesus says to Nicodemus something interesting. He says to Nicodemus this. He says, you must be born again. You see, you can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven my way. We, you and I can only get into heaven God's way. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, a leader, a religious leader of his day, that the only way to get there is to be born again. What does born again mean? 
Hollywood, popular culture, society, they've made a mockery out of that term. They think of radical, weirdo, out of control, Christianity. You know, I don't care what Hollywood says about the term born again because they don't have a concept of God in their lives. But born again from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible has always meant the same thing. And here's what it is. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. There it is. God's after an all or nothing relationship. He's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. You can't get to heaven by your works. You can't get to heaven by your good deeds. You can't get to heaven by the words of your mouth. You've got to give God all of your heart. You've got to give him all of your life. Interesting statement. Let me prove it to you again. In the, in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Jesus Christ speaking to the church. Hey, people like you and I, sitting here in the word of God, doing good things, doing good deeds. Jesus says to the church, I know your works. And I'm coming back, and when I come back, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Shocking statement designed to get your attention. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. But what does lukewarm mean? Let me, let me define that to you in terms of your relationship with God. Lukewarm means that you're a little bit in and you're a little bit out, a little bit up and a little bit down. Occasional church attendance here and again. You're doing some of your own thing. You're doing some of God's thing. You know, you maybe got religious uh, jewelry or cross or St. Christopher around your neck. You throw a token prayer out and again, you know, here and there. You know, you're really doing uh, more of your own thing than God's thing. You're riding the fence. You're riding that fence right down the middle. Jesus Christ says if you're lukewarm, you will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. You are buying into the lie that the devil has for you, that that's good enough, when the truth of the matter is, is that God's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. So how do we get there? You know, we can't get there your way. We can't get there my way. The only way we can get there is Jesus Christ, God's way. And Jesus says this. He says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, he says, I'll deny you before my Father. So in a moment, I want to give you the opportunity. Here's what I'm going to do. In a, count, in a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. Smack my hand on the Bible real loud, just like that. And when I, when, I, when I count to three and I hit my hand on the Bible, three, just like that, I want to give you the opportunity to make sure to ensure your place in eternity with heaven, in heaven with God for all of time to come. And what I'm going to ask you to do when I count to three is to pop your hand up. I'll ra you, you'll raise your hand. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. And what you're doing by raising your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to give Jesus Christ all of my life. Pastor Luke, I want to give him all of my heart. Today I want to go forward and I want to ensure my place with Jesus Christ in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever. I want to leave hell behind. What you, uh, you know, you might say, well, but Pastor Luke, if I raise my hand, you know, I don't know if I could do that. I'm going to be embarrassed. Somebody next to me or beside me, they're going to see me and, and they're going to know where I'm at. Hey, listen, you know what? I'm not going to embarrass you. But even if you were embarrassed, which you might be, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell? You see, the decision's yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way in or make his way in. The truth is, is that God already did everything he could by giving you his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess, to hang a spectacle on a cross for all to see so that you and I could give him all of our heart and give him all of our life. So in a moment, I'm going to count to three. Who should get their hand up? If you've never given Jesus Christ all of your heart, if you've never given him all your life, let's make today the day that you go forward for Jesus Christ and give him all of your heart, give him all your life. You put your hand up in a moment. I'll see it. You can put your hand right back down. We'll go forward from there. You should raise your hand if you're not sure. Don't leave this place without making sure. Hey, listen, the Bible tells us that life is a vapor. You don't know what tomorrow holds, so don't walk out of the doors of this place without making sure that you're going to get your place into heaven with Jesus Christ and with God forever and ever and ever and ever. You won't want to miss that opportunity. And finally, who should raise their hands if you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing? Uh, in a moment, when I count to three, get your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. And let's make today the day you go hot for God and you become the light that Jesus Christ says that you ought to be. Let's quit playing games. Let's quit messing around with God. You know, you might say right now in your heart, Pastor Luke, I feel like you're trying to push me or you're trying to manipulate me into making the decision for God. Hey, listen, I'm not trying to do any manipulation, but I am pushing you. You know why? Because we just read it today that the devil is pushing you to not take this, make this decision. That the devil is trying to push you in your way into hell. And you, be, you better thank God that you got somebody who loves you enough, who respects you enough to be pushy, to rub you the wrong way, to push you into the kingdom of God, to make you make the decision, to make you think about making that decision so that you get yourself in, the, in heaven for eternity.
forever and ever and ever and ever. The decision's yours. Let's do this all across, all across the auditorium. Hands are getting ready to go up. If that's you, let's move forward for God today. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in the house today. I see you. One, right there. All right. Anybody else in the place today? Two, I see you. Three, I got you right there. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. I see you. Fifteen in the family rooms. Sixteen right there. Seventeen. I see you. Eighteen. All right. Eighteen wise people. Hey. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? If there's 18, don't you know there's 20? Where are you at, number 19? Where are you at, number 20? You're saying, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. You need to get your hand up. Quit playing games with God, and let's make today the day you go forward for God. 18 wise people. Where are you at? Say, man, I wonder if I should. Hey, you know you might be saying, man, I wish this guy would shut up. I want to get out of here. Number 18. Number. I see you back there. All right. Number 19. Where are you at, number 20? Where are you at, number 20? I know you're in this. I can feel you by the Spirit of God. You're fighting this with inside. You're saying, man, I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know if I can do this today. You don't know what tomorrow holds. Don't leave this place today without making sure. Where are you at, number 20? Anybody else? I'm going to close this up. I'm going to close this up. Anybody else? Pop your hand up so I can see it. Put it right back down. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Anybody else today? Well, praise God for 19 wise people. Hallelujah. Hey, listen, here's what I want to do. For those of you who raised your hand from the front to the back, from the family rooms, if that's where you're at, all the way from the back to the front, doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter how young you are. If you raise your hand, what you said, you said, I want to give Jesus Christ all my heart, all my life. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus to come into your heart, come into your life, to be the Lord and Savior of your life. And we want to help you with that. We want to pray with you. So what we're going to do in a moment is we're going to all stand together. When I ask everybody to stand together, we're going to sing a song. And I want you to be bold. You said you were going to give him all your heart. You said you were going to give him all of your life. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, a friend if you need a friend, somebody that you came with, they'll come with you. And I want you to get out of your seat, get out of your chair from the family rooms, from the back to the front, doesn't matter where you're at. Get out of your seat, get out of your chair, get into the aisle and come and meet me up here. Let's change destinies together tonight. If that's you, come on, let's all stand together. And if that's you, you raise your hand or hey, you should have raised your hand. Come on down, you come. Lord, I give you my heart. Give you my soul. Come on, if that's you, you come. Come on, you can come. I'll live for you alone. Every breath that I take, and every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. Well, hey, praise God. Hey, listen, guys, today is the first day of the rest of your life. I want you to smile. You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birth celebration. Your birthday today, your spiritual birthday. Praise God. A day I promise you'll never forget. If you give God all of your heart and you really give God all of your life. So here's what I want to do. I want to do a couple things with you. I'm going to introduce a friend of mine to you. This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel right over here is one of the coolest guys you're going to meet. He's not going to do anything weird. I'm as weird as it gets, okay? I promise you that. He's going to take you right over there, and he's going to lead you in a prayer, okay? You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come and be the Lord and Savior of life, and he's going to pray with you. It's not about an abracadabra, magical words, and all of a sudden you're saved. No, it's about the heart, and God listens to the words of your heart. Secondly, he's going to give you some free things. Hey, free stuff! Awesome! We all like free stuff. He's going to give you some free literature, a book that our senior pastor wrote, Pastor Jim, called Welcome to Your Destiny. And it's a little bit of just super easy reading. You could probably read it within an hour or 45 minutes. Very simple. And it says, hey, I just got saved. What do I do now? And with some things, some tools to help you get strong in the ways of the Lord, to better understand the decisions you made. And third thing he's going to do, he's going to welcome you or invite you into a program that we have called Spiritual personal trainers. You know, you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer. A personal trainer will make sure that you're working the right muscles. They'll make sure that you're eating that spinach and all that nasty stuff that makes you strong. They're going to make sure that you're, you're, you're focusing your efforts in the right way. A spiritual personal trainer is a friend. Somebody that will meet with you right before service for a couple of weeks right down there at Love Rock Cafe. Hey, they'll buy you a cup of coffee. Pastor Jim always says they'll buy you a lobster or a steak dinner, whatever you want. But they'll meet with you for a couple of minutes right before service for a couple of weeks and they'll teach you some things about the Word of God to help you focus and and, and get strong in the ways of the Lord so that you don't go back to the junk that you came from and that you really are what we talked about today, the light of the world, and you be what Jesus called you to be. And I want to ask one more thing. I want to challenge you. I know that there's a lot. And you're like, Pastor Luke, I don't know how to take all this in. One more thing. Hey, listen, the Word of God spoke to you. It's not about what I said. The Bible tells us it's the goodness of God 
that brings men to repentance. It's not about me. It's about God. And Lord, Lord spoke to you here today. That's why you're here right now, because God spoke to you. And I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you to commit to come to the house of the Lord here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center where the God spoke to you to listen and to get the word of the Lord into you for 12 months. And I promise if you're able to do that, that you will look back 365 days from today and you will be surprised, you will be amazed at what God will do in your life. Am I lying? Come on, anybody in this place? Or is God going to bless you out of your socks if you give him your all? So if you guys would just go right over here with Pastor Joel. He's going to pray with you, all right? Hallelujah. Let's welcome them as they go. Hallelujah. Woo!